All right. So we've gone over the syllabus. Anybody know what this is a picture of? What is it? Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam. Yes. Right. This is the dam that's pretty close to Las Vegas. I think it features prominently in one of the Transformers movies, although I don't remember which one. Uh, I mean, it's just all a blur once a Transformer movie starts. But uh, it's a really interesting dam. It's been there since, I think, the 1920s. It generates most of the electricity that's used by uh, the city of Las Vegas. And so I think it's a good illustration for some of the things that we're going to learn about this semester, both closed conduit flow and open channel flow. We're going to begin each semester with an announcement slide, e each class meeting. Uh, so the, uh, the to-do list, you need to purchase the textbook, review the syllabus that I've just handed out to you, get a three-ring binder to start putting these materials into. I suggest that you print the notes. And then homework one is posted right now on Blackboard. Oh, I don't think I ever did finally get around to showing you the assignment itself. So if you click on it, here's the assignment. Some of them are calculation problem solving type questions. Some of them are questions related to the syllabus. So that's due next Wednesday. Due by 1 p.m. on Wednesday. All right. So today we're going to be talking about flow resistance, which um, begins in chapter 7 of our textbook. If you've got the book, my recommendation is that after today's class meeting, you review sections 1 through section 3 of uh, chapter 7 in the book. Any announcement questions? All right. So we... Uh, we looked at the Hoover Dam a minute ago, and here's another really interesting hydraulic-related uh, wonder of the world, the Magdeburg Bridge in Germany. It's a river going over another river, which, and you've probably seen a lot of rivers, but they don't ordinarily do this. Rivers don't usually cross on top of each other. And obviously, this is an engineered solution. This is something that they made specifically so that barge traffic between two industrial centers in Germany um, could save a little bit of time. Because in the past, what they had to do was they had to take a more circuitous route of going on the Elba River. They had to go like upriver quite a ways, sail down the Elba, and then turn around and go up another side canal to get between, I'm not going to try and butch you these names, but I think you get the point that uh, the shortest distance between two locations is a straight line, and barring that, a more direct route than this circuitous one was. So they saved some time, and the Germans decided it was worth spending $500 million to save that time. So now barges can go back and forth directly between these two industrial centers without having to go through the Elbe River. It's really interesting. Um, similarly, here's another structure that's kind of interesting. This is a boat lift. I think this is in Scotland where um, little watercraft can be lifted upwards and then they go for it. All this trough is just full of water and so it's a canal lift lifting boats from a lower level lake up to an elevated canal. Now it's not just in Europe that they have interesting hydraulic structures. We've got them in fact just right next door here in Huntington we're adjacent to the Ohio River, which is one of the most important navigable waterways in the entire world. Um, the Ohio River, uh, starting at Pittsburgh, you can see all of these different locks and canal. Um, and there are different Army Corps of Engineers districts that are assigned to different sections of the river. And what this enables is the shipment of really heavy crops like coal and grain, which are uh, too bulky and heavy to be shipped economically by things like truck. And even by train is much less economical than sending things by barge. And so the United States kind of has an unfair advantage compared to a lot of other countries where uh, there are a lot of countries where their agricultural areas don't have rivers running through them like ours do. And so we have this really cheap and uh, efficient way 
of moving cargo through the country and it extends as far north as Minnesota. There's a separate navigable river system that in the Pacific Northwest extends as far as Idaho. And of course, the Missouri River, the Mississippi River, here's it's illustrating the Ohio River. We're just really spoiled to have these river networks available. And um, so much of the lock and dam system that keeps this network functional is old and aging that a lot of it needs to be replaced. And you're entering the civil engineering profession at a really exciting time where there's more opportunity than at any point since civil engineering has been on my radar. Um, when I graduated and start, uh, first started my job, civil engineering jobs were a little bit scarce. The economy was going through a bit of a dip when I first graduated. And so I'm always envious when I hear stories from our recent graduates, for example, that each one of them had multiple job offers to consider and that there was just so much opportunity available. So part of the reason why is that our forebearers in the 1920s did a lot of work <clears throat> that now is ready to be replaced and refurbished, whether it's bridges, dams, locks, and so on. So hydraulic engineering is the analysis and design of systems related to water. And specifically, we're talking about amounts of water and the timing of water is really critical because people use water at different rates during different times of the day. Um, even if you knew what your average daily use of water is, sizing the pipes that go into your house shouldn't be based on your average daily use of water. It should be based on the maximum use of water because you don't want a pipe that's only big enough to deliver the average flow rate that you're consuming, but you want the pipe to be sized so that it's large enough to deliver the peak flow rate that you might want to have. So hydraulic engineering considers those human factors to size pipes and canals and also considers the probability and the statistics distribution of the effect of things like weather. So we're going to be studying water in closed conduit environments, in open channels, and in reservoirs. And uh, there's a phrase that people say, water is life. And I've heard people speculate that many of the wars of this century are going to be fought over water uh, because water is scarce. And it's unfortunately because of uh, climate variability in a lot, of, a lot of places in the world, water is becoming more scarce where there will be periods of heavy flash flood followed by periods of lengthy drought. And even if the quantity of water is the same, having uh, flash floods interspersed with drought is a lot less favorable to growing crops, for example, than a more steady distribution of water, which is more common in the past. So hydraulic engineering is changing because climate variability, and there's a lot of ties of water into legal issues and economic effects and financial considerations. So it's a really charged topic, which is part of the reason why it's so enjoyable. This is a picture that I took uh, when I was working on my PhD. This is in the basement of a water treatment plant in Carmel, Indiana. I got my PhD from Purdue, which is in West Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, about an hour down the road from West Lafayette is the town of Carmel. And I was doing some experiments at this water treatment plant related to ultraviolet disinfection of drinking water. But I spent a lot of time in what's called the pipe gallery. So this is the water that came out of sand filters was being pumped up to the next stage of the treatment plant. And they had a lot of different pumps. And depending on the flow rate at any given time, sometimes they'd have two pumps or three pumps operating. Or uh, you know, there was a sequence of how many pumps would be operating depending on the flow rate that they're trying to produce and what was down for maintenance and so on. And as you might expect, the hydraulic calculations that says how big should a pipe be or what material properties are going to have what effect on pressure loss, those calculations are kind of complicated, but they're also really interesting. So we're going to spend some time this semester talking about why different pipe materials and sizes get selected and how we can know what's an appropriate size given the demand and the design constraints. Uh, this is a picture that I took when I was living in the United Arab Emirates. Um, I lived there for about five years in total. And it's a very arid environment. You can see that these mountains don't have a stitch of greenery on them. Um, they're just bare rock and sand. 
And when it rains there, there's not a lot of rain. They only get about four inches of rain per year. Compared to here in West Virginia, we get about 40. So we get about 10 times as much precipitation as they do in the United Arab Emirates. But when it rains, because it's so steep and because the terrain is so rocky, the water moves very quickly. They have these flashy storm events that goes through these open channels. And this is just to carry the water straight out to the sea. So the question in situations like this is, how big should the, ch uh, the channel be? It's partly related to how does the storm react when it's falling onto the land surface. But how big the channel should be also depends on how rough is the concrete or what's the, uh, the geometric effect. It looks like we've got a trapezoidal channel here with a two to one side slope. What if we made the channel a little bit deeper? Would it not need to be as wide? Or what if it was lined in something more smooth than concrete? What if it was lined with plastic? Then how would that affect the water flowing through that channel? That's part of what we're going to handle this semester in hydraulic engineering. Uh, here's a photo I took a few years ago in California. Um, I don't remember the name of this lake. Uh, it's in Northern California. I was just visiting on vacation. But I took the photo because this was during a particularly wet year. The water was, um, was as high as it ever is. But uh, California has really suffered from uh, year after year of successive drought. And right now, they're having some flash floods in California. And a lot of the headlines I've seen talking about those flash floods are saying, you know, people shouldn't get their hopes up. Just because there's these flash floods now doesn't mean that the drought is over because it's hard to trap enough water when it all comes at once. You can fill up the dams, but then if there's not a lot of snow in the mountains, that's really how water gets stored long term is by snowpack in the mountains. And it's, apparently it's been warm enough during these storms that most of the water that's been collected has been rain, which is tough to, to trap any more than the dams can hold, whereas really what they'd prefer is to have snowpack. So in any case, reservoirs and dams are an important part of hydraulic engineering as well, and one of the ways that we can uh, ensure that water is available for use. I mentioned that there is a project this semester, and we implement the project in a hypothetical small town to address the question of what does a hydraulic engineer do? You're going to get a feel for more than just formulas this semester, although I'm going to share with you plenty of formulas. You're going to have lots of formulas. There's an equation sheet that I'll give you uh, which will be a nice way for you to begin to just kind of wrap your head around like what's the total body of things that you need to begin to learn. Uh, but more than just formulas, I want you to learn processes and a mindset, a problem solving and a design mindset of the iterative design process of you know, figuring out, for example, at these different locations, what pressure do you want to deliver to people when you know how much water is going to be drawn out. Like at each of these green arrows, you're going to know the demand for water. Let's say 100 liters per second at location L. So if you know they need 100 liters per second at location L, then the question will be, how big should be the pipe that connects A to L in order to, to assure a certain pressure is available? And then the entire network will be all of these different locations connected by different pipe sizes the computer software that you're going to be using will simulate um, demand and tell you what the pressure is. And you'll go in and make tweaks and changes to try and save your client money. You'll reduce pipe sizes as much as possible while still maintaining acceptable pressure. You'll be cutting out certain pipes that look like they're dead ends to see if you can get away with eliminating certain pipes altogether and still having an acceptable level of performance. So I think it's a really interesting project and one that if you are, uh, are careful and hardworking can, uh, can be done progressively and not all at once at the end of the semester. There's different uh, intermediate uh, submissions that you have to do. If you look at the schedule, I have you submit things in phases. So it, it never feels like you've got all this thing to do just right before the deadline you kind of uh, are able to spread it out and break it up. And I think that makes it a little bit more enjoyable. OK, in fluid mechanics, I'm sure that you talked about flow resistance. And uh, this is showing water flowing through a pipe. 
where there's more turbulence at the boundaries of the pipe, at the edge of the pipe where the no slip condition applies. This I think you can probably sense is water that's flowing over a spillway and the different colors represent velocity. So at the edge of the channel where the velocity are low, then the color is blue, but then as the velocity is faster, you're getting yellow and even red. So where there's more resistance to flow, the velocity is going to be lower. So at the pipe, which is motionless and is applying a shear stress to the fluid, then the fluid is going to, is going to have a lower velocity. So flow resistance depends on the viscosity of the fluid. And remember, some fluids like water have a relatively low viscosity, a relatively low resistance to being moved around. But then other fluids like glycerin or maybe honey have higher viscosity, which means that they flow more slowly when a shear stress is applied. Flow conditions like velocity, depth, the conduit uniformity, the degree of turbulence, all of these things can influence how much resistance there is to flow, as well as the channel itself. If you've got a small pipe versus a large pipe, the large pipe is going to have relatively more of the flow area that's not under the influence of the resistance that is applied at the boundary by the motionless pipe. So anybody here remember laminar versus turbulent flow? Is that something you learned last semester? Where the differentiation typically is thought of as anything less than a Reynolds number of 2,000 is laminar flow. Reynolds number of more than 4,000 is turbulent. What is Reynolds number? Here, this is a good bit of trivia. Anybody remember the formula for how you calculate Reynolds number? Velocity times diameter. No, wait, that might be oh, I really like where this is going. I don't know if it would be. Kinematic viscosity. Oh, wait. Good. Yeah. So velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. That's right. Good. So um, flow resistance depends on whether conditions are laminar and turbulent. And oftentimes we have different equations that apply depending on the flow condition. Now the Moody diagram is one that I hope that you saw last semester. I see some nodding heads. It sounds like Dr. Yoon gave you the proper experience. If you saw the Moody diagram, that's good. So a Moody diagram says that here on the bottom axis, the Reynolds number of the fluid is one of the factors that dictates the friction factor, F. And the other component of that is the relative roughness of the pipe. So this K sub S is a reflection of the pipe material. So if you've got a really rough pipe that's made out of something like asphalt or concrete, then it would have a relatively high K sub S value compared to if it was drawn glass, which is really smooth. So this um, Darcy Wiesbach equation, H sub F, is talking about how much head loss there is due to pipe friction. And the head loss due to pipe friction is a function of the friction factor, the length of the pipe, the velocity of the flow, the diameter of the pipe, and then 2g, where g is the gravitational constant. So let's see. We've got three minutes left for this example. I don't want to rush the example. So this is where we're going to pick up when we get together on Wednesday. Is we're going to look at this example and figure out what is the correct friction factor to use for this. If you can't wait, if you just need to jump ahead and work on this before Wednesday, I understand completely that I will allow it. So this is in the notes if you want to get an early start on it. But just to reiterate what you ought to be doing between now and Wednesday, get the book, print the notes, and buy a three-ring binder. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>